Chapter 16 The glad word went round Rizm one March morning that the earliest flower in Perdita's garden was in bloom. The day was one of those glories of the English springtime, with large white clouds blown across wide spaces of blue sky by the southwest wind, and with swift shadows that bowled across the green below them. Parliament was in full conclave that day, and in the elms the rooks were busy. An awful flatness had succeeded Olga's departure. Rizm naturally took a good deal of credit for the tremendous success which had attended the production of Lucrezia, since it so rightly considered that the real cradle of the opera was here, where she had tried it over for the first time. Lucia seemed to remember it better than anybody, for she remembered all sorts of things which no one else had the faintest recollection of. How she had discussed music with Signor Cortese, and he had asked her where she had her musical training. Such a treat to talk Italian with a Roman, lingua Toscana in Bocca Romana, and what a wonderful evening it was. Poor Mrs. Colonel recollected very little of this, but Lucia had long been aware that her memory was going, sadly. After producing Lucrezia in New York, Olga had appeared in some of her old roles, notably in the part of Brunhilde, and Lucia was very reminiscent of that charming party of Christmas Day at Dio Giorgino's, when they had the tableau. Dear Olga was so simple and unspoiled, she had come to Lucia afterwards and asked her to tell her how she had worked out her scheme of gestures in the awakening, and Lucia had been very glad, very glad indeed, to give her a few hints. In fact, Lucia was quite herself. It was only her subjects whom it had been a little hard to stir up. Georgie, in particular, had been very listless and dull, and Lucia, for all her ingenuity, was at a complete loss to find a reason for it. But today the warm, inflowing tide of spring seemed to renovate the muddy flats, setting the weeds that had lain dank and dispirited afloating again on the return of the water. No one could quite resist the magic of the season, and Georgie, who had intended out of mere politeness to go to see the earliest of Perdita's stupid flowers, having been warned of its epiphany by telephone from the hearst, found, when he set foot outside his house on that warm, windy morning, that it would be interesting to stroll across the green first and see if there was any news. All the news he had really cared about for the last two months was news from America, of which he had a small packet done up with a pink ribbon. After getting rid of Piggy, he went to the newspaper shop to get his times, which most unaccountably had not arrived, and the sight of Todd's news in its yellow cover stirred his drowsy interest. Not one atom of light had ever been thrown on that extraordinary occurrence when Robert bought the whole issue, and though Olga never failed to inquire, he had not been able to give her the slightest additional information. Occasionally he set a languid trap for one of the Quantocks, but they never by any chance fell into it. The whole affair must be classed with problems like the origin of evil, among the insoluble mysteries of life. It was possible to get letters by the second post an hour earlier than the house-to-house -house delivery by calling at the office, and as Georgie was waiting for his times, Mrs. Quantock came hurrying out of the post office with a small packet in her hands, which she was opening as she walked. She was so much absorbed by this that she did not see Georgie at all, though she passed quite close to him, and soon after shed a registered envelope. At that the old familiar glamour began to steal over him again, and he found himself wondering with intensity what it contained. She was now some hundred yards in front of him, walking in the direction of the hearst, and there could be no doubt that she too was on her way to see Perdita's first flower. He followed her, going more briskly than she, and began to catch her up. Soon, this time by accident, not in the manner in which, through eagerness, she had untidily cast the registered envelope away, she dropped a small paper, and Georgie picked it up, meaning to give it her. It had printed matter on the front of it, and was clearly a small pamphlet. He could not possibly help seeing what that printed matter was, for it was in capital letters. Increase your height. Georgie quickened his step, and the old familiar glamour brightened around him. As soon as he got within speaking distance, he called to her, and, turning round, like a guilty thing surprised, a little box flew out of her hand. As it fell, the lid came off, and there were scattered on the green grass a multitude of red lozenges. She gave a cry of dismay. 
Oh, Mr. Georgie, how you startled me, she said. Do help me pick them up. Do you think the damp will have hurt them? Any news? I was so wrapped up in what I was doing that I've spoken to nobody. Georgie assisted in the recovery of the red lozenges. You dropped this as you walked, he said. I picked it up in order to give it you. Ah, that is kind. And did you see what it was? I couldn't help seeing the outside, said Georgie. She looked at him a moment, wondering what was the most prudent course. If she said nothing more, he would probably tell everybody. Well, then I shall tell you the whole secret, she said. It's the most wonderful invention, and increases your height, whatever your age is, from two to six inches. Fancy. There are some exercises you have to do, rather like those yoga ones, every morning, and you eat three lozenges a day. Quite harmless they are, and then you soon begin to shoot up. It sounds incredible, doesn't it? But there are so many testimonials that I can't doubt it is genuine. Here's one of a man who grew six inches. I saw it advertised in some paper and sent for it. Only a guinea. What fun when Robert begins to see that I am taller than he is. <laughs> but now not a word. Don't tell dear Lucia whatever you do. She is half a head taller than I, and it would be no fun if everybody grew from two to six inches. You may write for them, and I'll give you the address, but you must tell nobody. Too wonderful, said Georgie. I shall watch you. Here we are. Look, there's Perdita's flower. What a beauty. It was not necessary to press the mermaid's tail, for Lucia had seen them from the music room, and they heard her high heels clacking over the polished floor of the hall. Listen, no more need of high heels, said Mrs. Grantock, and I've got something else to tell you. Lucia may hear that. Ah, dear Lucia, what a wonderful Perdita blossom. Is it not, said Lucia, blowing kisses to Georgie and giving them to Daisy. That shows spring is here, primavera. And Peppino's piccolo libro comes out today. I should not be a bit surprised if each of you found a copy of it arrived before evening. Glorious. It's glorious. Surely it was no wonder that Georgie's blood began to canter along his arteries again. There had been very pleasant, exciting years before now, requiring for their fuel no more than was ready at this moment to keep up the fire. Mrs. Quantock was on tiptoe so to speak, to increase her height. Peppino was just delivered of a second of these vellum volumes with seals and tapes outside. Mrs. Weston was going to become Mrs. Colonel at the end of the week, and at the same hour and church Elizabeth was going to become Mrs. Atkinson. Had these things no savour, because... How is you? said Georgie, with a sudden flush of the springtime through him. Me very well, thank you, and me so want to read Peppino's bookie-bookie. Who come in? said Lucia. Everybody come in. Now, who's got a good news? Mrs. Quantock had been walking on her toes across the hall in anticipation of the happy time when she would be from two to six inches taller. As the animated pamphlet said, the world assumed a totally different aspect when you were even two inches taller. She was quite sorry to sit down. Is next week very full with you, dear Lucia? she asked. Lucia pressed her finger to her forehead. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, she began. No, not Tuesday. I am doing nothing on Tuesday. You want to be the death of me between you. Why? Why? I hope that my dear friend Princess Popovsky will be staying with me, said Mrs. Quantock. Do get over your prejudice against spiritualism and give it a chance. Come to a séance on Tuesday. You too, of course, Georgie. I know better than to invite Lucia without you. Lucia put on the faraway look which she reserved for the masterpieces of music and for Georgie's hopeless devotion. Lovely. That will be lovely, she said. Most interesting. I shall come with a perfectly open mind. Georgie scarcely lamented the annihilation of a mystery. He must surely have imagined the mystery, for it all collapsed like a card house if the princess was coming back. The séances had been most remarkable, too, and he would have to get out his planchette again. "'And what's going to happen on Wednesday?' he asked Lucia. "'All I know is I've not been asked. Me's offended.' "'Equal surprise,' said Lucia. "'You're not engaged that evening, are you? Nor you, dear Daisy.' "'That's lovely. Eight o'clock? No, I think a quarter two. That will give us more time. I shan't tell you what it is.' 
Mrs. Crantock, grasping her lozenges, wondered how much taller she would be by then. As Lucia played to them, she drew a lozenge out of the box and put it into her mouth, in order to begin growing at once. It tasted rather bitter, but not unpleasantly so. <laughs> 